struggling uh, lately, and I've been under attack, and uh, spiritually attacked. And uh, one evening, I just I I walked my property, and I, and I just prayed out to God to show me what is happening. And uh, this is last Saturday night, as a matter of fact, after the memorial for Brenda. And uh, the death of uh, Brenda brought back uh, junk out of my trunk and attacked me from the death of my daughter. And I, Marie had pointed it out to me before. She saw it before. And uh, so I dealt with that. And uh, praise the Lord, he was there and opened my eyes, opened my heart, opened my ears. And I could hear and see, and I, I was up till two o'clock getting out the prayer, and didn't get to bed till three, and still was up by six to send it out or whatever. I mean, it was, I was energized. So turn your, turn it over to God and ask for, for help. And that's not always easy for, especially people like me that are control freak. But I'm in recovery, so it's uh, it's something you got to do. You just got to share share with the Lord is the best thing you can do. Do we have any prayer requests? Yes. I do have a praise. I have a wonderful four day weekend, and we spent the majority of the fishing, and it was totally awesome. So. Hard work pays off on the, yes, on the path that the Lord has laid before you. Amen. Not take, trying to take the shortcut. <laughs> they don't work out, do they? Praise the Lord. Amen. Any other praises? And I'll elaborate a little bit on with uh, Patty. She is struggling with some pretty severe pain right now. And the cancer is back. And so she goes next week? Thursday. Thursday. This Thursday. To uh, see what their options are with that. So. And I have a friend, Barb, that is. Uh, Struggling with physical and financial woes. Um, now she has no car and that type of thing. The car was, wasn't lost to finances, it was lost because she tried to help people. And they basically destroyed her car. So, generosity sometimes can fight you. But uh, we'll pray for her. I know more about it than. Probably in that way. For my dad, um, he's just, he doesn't understand what's wrong with him, but he can definitely tell that he's struggling health wise. Um, and whenever I ask him questions, he just says he's fine. He doesn't ever, but he can definitely tell there's something going on. Um, 
just yeah. it's not there. Yes, David. Bill, the, uh, one of our employees died over the weekend. Uh, as we talked to him on a piece of steak, he said swallowed the horse was not infected. And, uh, he was 53 years old when he had a family of five besides himself. He was a parent of some of them they know that it's a kid for family from uh, Hopkins. Surprises are tough to deal with. That kind of surprise. Anybody else need prayers? Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with prayers to pray and for petitions. We know that you are a merciful God. You have answered so many prayers for us. We are the prayer warriors. We pray for Barbara as she is struggling with health issues and financial troubles. She has a generous heart, Lord. And please guide her guide others to her that will be helpful. Open other people's eyes and ears and hearts to her and bring peace and comfort to her. We pray for Dennis as he struggled with anger issues. Father, guide him Show him, have the Holy Spirit go in and talk to his spirit directly. Just guide him, comfort him, bring him peace. Because we know that only through your love that things will shine brightly within him and guide him to where he needs to be in that peace. So rain love down upon us. your light shine on We pray for Lisa's dad as he struggled with, with health issues. <clears throat> Father, we ask that you comfort him and, and open his eyes and ears to himself. He is a, I'm seeing that he is such a loving, giving person that he has not paid attention to himself. He's always giving to others. And Father, it's time for others to give to him. And bring your love down upon him so he can see within himself and find that peace that he always gives to other people. Bring, bring comfort to his family. And uh, just open, open his eyes to within himself. We pray for the Kurt Kentler family. For his son, death. Father, uh, this is a, a horrible time to deal with with their family. Something so unexpected, something so so tragic that uh, bring them peace, comfort in their in their grief and mourning. Let them open, be open to others. Let them be able to see that not everybody grieves the same way. They have comfort and peace.
leads through that. To help them find the closure that they need so it doesn't hinder them and lead them to a darker side of comfort. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with it. All deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must pray pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Now that you have tasted it, have, now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness,
This is our cry to God. Father, we thank you. The older I get, the more I take on the emotions of those who are around me. <laughs> and, um, I don't know, it, I don't think it's necessarily the older I get, it's, I think it's the closer I get to God. And I, I, I pray for God to give me a heart for what He has a heart for, and that includes that's both good and bad, right? And so when we walk alongside people who are in pain, we, we end up taking on some of that, and not necessarily in a bad way, but in a, in a way that helps us, as Tim said, to process some of our own stuff that we maybe push down a little bit. And um, it was actually um, the anniversary of my dad's death back in 2008, just um, recently too, and it was one of those things that I didn't realize just the perfect timing of it. it. It was one of those things I realized it really maybe didn't have kind of the process very well. So here we are. So let's pray. Um, oh Lord, we thank you that you are indeed great and you are good and that it is your breath that is in our lungs and that it's your spirit that lives in us. And so when we breathe in and we breathe out, we can be rest assured that, that we are breathing in your creation, really. You are the one who gives us the breath in our lungs. And so we deeply desire to know you and to know you more intimately. And so as we read your word and we spend the next few minutes together, we just ask that you speak to us. Use your still small voice to speak to those areas within us that maybe we need to bring to you and to lay at your feet. And we also ask that you give us eyes to see the joy and the goodness that is in this world that some days feels like there's nothing but chaos. So thank you that you are not a God of chaos, but you are a God of light and a God of peace. And you are welcome here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. All right, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 15. This was written by King Solomon, who, who was a very wise man who had anything and everything that money could possibly buy, but yet at the end of his life realized that, that much of that was really meaningless in the grand scheme of things. And so hear this from his perspective. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. 
a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men, he has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fail them what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has always been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. This is the word of the Lord. So everything that we have in life is under God's control. And that's what Solomon is saying here. And at times, I think we think that our perspective is the only right perspective, and that our way of doing things or thinking is the right way. And with the election coming up, you can see that a lot. Like, if you don't believe this, then you're this. Like, there's, there's my way is the right way, what I think is the right way to think. And Solomon, though, he causes us to take some steps back and to really look at where God is in the midst of it, where we are in the midst of it, and how those things, where we are and where God is, ought to affect the way that we respond to God. And in the end, Solomon says that if you really have the right perspective on God and on life, you'll find the joy that you're yearning for. And we're all yearning for peace and for joy and it, it's, it's innately in there. God put it in there. We're created that way. So Solomon starts out in verse 1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. We can't judge by what we see. Because God, who is in heaven and we are under heaven, we don't have the ability to be able to see everything in all of the moving parts. So being under heaven, that there's a season for every activity under heaven, speaks to our vantage point that we are under God's complete control because we are under heaven. And Solomon calls us to recognize our position. And then he calls us to see that since God is good, that the chaos is also must be orderly. He uses the word time 28 times in this particular passage, and he talks about the measurement of time and the circumstances of what happens during time. He covers every possible aspect, and he emphasizes that God's heavenly authority is over all time. God is the king over his creation, and he's the king over time, which is also something that he created. So this, I think, is something that we struggle with. In verse 9, he says, what does the worker gain from his toil? That's a good question. What do we gain from our toil? If God's in control of everything, and if everything, there's a specific season, then what's the point? What's going to happen is going to happen, right? So why be good? Why care? 
Why do anything but just do what we want to do because God's in control in ways? If he ordained it, then, then why, why can't we just live? Who cares? And when he says, he made everything beautiful in its time, the first part of verse 11. He made everything beautiful in its time. That's why we care. We care because we are part of the solution. Because we are part of what God is doing. And on a much grander scale, Solomon is trying to get our minds off our own selfish desires and the things that we want. And he's saying, look at him. Stop looking at what you want and thinking about what you want and submit to the one who created all things. And if we refuse to be in awe of God's magnificent power, if there was a thunderstorm that rolled through last night, that was raw power. If we refuse to stand in awe of who God is, then you will never, ever, ever find peace or be at rest. That's the only thing that we really need to understand and that we only really need to grasp is that he has made everything beautiful in its time. And that is the fact that God made everything beautiful in its time is a hope-filled promise to God's people. It's a promise that while we don't understand the hows or the whys, that we do know this, that we worship a God that will reveal his beauty and he will reveal the answers at his perfect time, even when it hurts. And we can't get away from the fact that we need to keep our eyes on God and that we need to gaze up and we need to keep our gaze on the one who created us and the one who gave us life. The second half of verse 11, Solomon writes, he also has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I mean, shoot, if you look through the, the Bible and you read what, what God has done and you read the stories, every time he revealed himself, it seems like they, they still didn't get it. They still struggled. Even the 12 who walked with Jesus to the cross still were confused. And they were with him and they saw the miracles. And he told them point blank, this is what I'm here for. So if you're resistant to acknowledging that God is over all. And if you're resistant to not wanting to give up your own selfish desires, then Solomon says that you can't get away, you will never get away from the fact that you need him. You will never get away from it. That God created you with an internal longing within your heart. He set eternity in the hearts of men and women. We have a God-sized hole in our hearts. That's why people self-medicate. Some people have a shopping addiction. Some maybe watch TV too much. Some turn to drugs or alcohol. We're all trying to fill a hole in our heart because we want to feel fulfilled and we want to feel satisfied and we're looking to the wrong things to fill what is in here. C.S. Lewis, whom I love, wrote in Mere Christianity, and he says it so beautifully. The Christian says, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire, well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy,
satisfy. The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care, on the one hand, never to despise or to be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other, never to mistake them for another or for something else of which they are only a kind of copy or an echo or a mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and to help others to do the same. I love the near the end there where he says that we should never settle for a kind of copy or an echo or a mirage. And that's what we do settle for because we want instant gratification and we want things to be our way and we want it to be that way now. When essentially what's going on in here is that we're longing for restoration and we're longing for eternity. Eternity is set in your heart. There's a void in here that can only be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit when we turn to Jesus and we receive him as our Lord and Savior. We are filled with the Holy Spirit and it fills that void. But yet we continue on with life and we get caught up in life and we get caught up in our own selfish desires and we squash that spirit. So as Tim said earlier, it's time to pray for it to be reawakened. First Peter. Every human being has to come face to face with the fact that there is an eternal God, whether they believe in him or not. We are all going to come to a point where we're going to have to drop to our knees and go before our Savior and come face to face with the fact that there is an eternal God. We weren't meant to be the masters of our own faith, but we are meant to know the master of it all. And we didn't create our purpose. God has put a purpose in each and every one of your hearts. And if we were created for God, our joy should come out of living into this design that we were made to live into. That's where joy comes. Joy doesn't come in what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, what kind of job you have. You are never, ever going to be happy with the more you get, the more you get, the more you get. The only way you're going to be happy is if you submit to him and you live for him and you live in the moment and you just grasp the moment whether it's chaotic, that's where our anger holds. We weather the storm. Tomorrow's a new day. And all we do, glorifying God, should be our aim. And without him, we're lost. So, for example, when we help our kids with our, their homework, it isn't merely about making them smarter and having them complete a task, but it's helping our kids to recognize that God gave them a brain for a purpose. And in helping them and walking alongside them through it, it shows them the love of Christ by the way that we come alongside them and love them and nurture them. Every opportunity is an opportunity to glorify God. Working a job isn't merely you get a fat paycheck and a big raise. It's so that people can see God's image in you and through you, and that they'll be able to draw closer to God through your example. And coming and gathering in church isn't to impress God, it's not to impress each other. 
but we're here to be amazed by him. And we're here to anticipate the day when God's church is going to gather together, and as a whole family, we're going to be together for eternity. And to find that hope, we come to be fed through the music and through his word and through each other. So, tomorrow isn't promised. And there's a time for everything. So my prayer for you, and for me, is that we will have eyes to see that God indeed has made everything beautiful. Even the chaos, you can find nuggets of beauty in the chaos. That we are set for eternity and that that is set on the heart of our hearts and that be what we pursue and that be what we seek. And know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that we will revere him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for our, our church, for each and every man, woman, and child that is here, for those that, that want to be here but aren't ready to gather in person just yet. Father, we pray Lord, that you bless our family, that you bless us with wisdom, you give us eyes to see you in all things, give us opportunities to turn towards you and to live into your word and to receive the love that you have for us. Give us eyes to be able to see ourselves as men and women and children who are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for the gift of life. May we live each day to its fullest so that we can one day come before you and hear those beautiful, beautiful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. And so we praise you. And as we go into this closing song, may our voices just be sweet, sweet, a sweet, sweet offering unto your ears. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
Go in peace to love and serve.